Good afternoon, Penn Staters, and thank you for joining us. I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and I'd like to welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session. As many of us have transitioned to living, working, and learning remotely, the Alumni Association is ensuring you stay connected to one another in the university and also staying informed. And as a reminder, today's discussion will be recorded. Today, we welcome Dr. Vijay Narayanan, Today's discussion is the latest installment of a recurring series of virtual programming that the Alumni Association is bringing to the Penn State community. We'll be speaking with experts, university leaders, and other Penn Staters who will share insight and perspective with you in the coming weeks and months. Additionally, the Alumni Association offers a host of online networking and career programs and webinars, and you can view a full list of all of these events at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Now I'm happy to welcome Dr. Vijay Narayanan, who is the Robert Knoll Chair Professor of Computer Science and Engineering and Electrical Engineering here at Penn State. He has published more than 500 papers in the fields of power-aware computing, embedded systems, and computer architecture with more than 22,000 citations. While our day-to-day -day lives have changed significantly due to the pandemic, there are some for whom social distancing practices are even more challenging. Dr. Narayanan will discuss the technology that his research team is developing in this area, as well as how student researchers continue to push ahead in their effort to assist those in need in spite of all the social distancing challenges. Thank you for joining us this morning, Dr. Narayanan. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you uh, very much uh, and a good afternoon to all of you uh, joining in. Uh, the presentation that I'm going to share with you is a work that we have been doing for around eight years and uh, has needed uh, some additional uh, changes over the past uh, two months given uh, the pandemic situation. And uh, the student researchers and my colleagues have been uh, wonderful in responding to coming up with uh, some new innovations to help uh, those that are visually impaired uh, in novel ways, as you will see. And uh, I would also like to share some of the uh, great things the students continue to do, uh, innovate in their uh, basements and uh, in their bedrooms, uh, even as uh, the university uh, uh, stays uh, physically uh, closed for most of us. Today's talk is going to be uh, about um, uh, assistive uh, system that we have been developing for the visually impaired. And if you were wondering the title, Third Eye, uh, maybe uh, some of the pictures here give you a clue. Uh, but um, if you look across uh, cultures, uh, you basically have the notion of a third eye as the eye of compassion or the eye of fury if you do something wrong. And it basically has uh, things from Asian cultures to uh, also pre-Inca cultures where the third eye is actually ubiquitous. And uh, using this uh, cultural inspiration to be benevolent and helping people could not be more appropriate at this time uh, when we all need to pull all our weight together. The third eye uh, 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 incarnation that I'm going to be talking about is more uh, a, a computer incarnation. And uh, we have been working on this for more than 15 years on uh, various applications, including uh, drones that can identify objects, uh, identify intruders and uh, uh, facial analytics. Uh, and the key to all this is the ability of the computer to autonomously understand and reason about the visual images that it actually lands up seeing. And of course, it's lunchtime, so uh, here is one of the technology working in. As you saw the person up here, you saw the uh, uh, salad change to something that uh, uh, Kevin, one of the uh, former uh, students in my uh, lab who now runs a company based on this uh, video analytics area, so he likes burgers more than salad. So these are some of the type of things that 
uh, you can land up doing. Uh, feel free to uh, uh, have a bite when uh, listening to this uh, virtual uh, talk. So uh, application that I'm going to be uh, uh, discussing about of this visual analytics is on developing an assistant for the visually impaired uh, uh, to be uh, um, shopping on their own. And this sort of independence is particularly important uh, as you will see uh, is some of the social uh, uh, helpers who can uh, hold hands with uh, some of our uh, visually impaired uh, uh, community neighbors is not really an option uh, in this uh, social distancing era. And some of the technologies that I'm going to be talking would be even more uh, helpful uh, in, in this scenario. Technologies going from uh, vision algorithms to hardware architectures to technologies that uh, decide how you interface with the visual impaired are all challenges that we uh, have been addressing towards developing this application. But the first thing to uh, do in all these things is not to come back and say, hey, I have a technology, where is the use? But rather to go and try and figure out what is the need how can technology come and address the need and overcome the obstacles and uh, challenges that are there? Challenges we have are because they're such big spaces is um, figuring out the layout of the location for like mall, like, you know, you said for malls and for um, maybe office buildings and places like that that are much larger than, you know, what a home environment would be to have assistance um, instead of taking, you know, five, ten minutes to try and figure it out all on your own sometimes. There are a couple other workarounds using apps with face-to-face -face people. Maybe sometimes you don't really want to talk to somebody, so just having that independence on your own uh, without an individual is really currently not a an option that is easy to act. So as you can uh, uh, see from uh, this video, uh, there really is not a great solution uh, to help uh, individuals being independent. And uh, uh, while this video and feelings were recorded before uh, the pandemic, it's even become uh, excruciatingly difficult uh, with the uh, non-availability of people to help you uh, in these type of situations. And this is really where technology can actually play a, a role. And uh, the need, as you can, uh, to be summarized by what uh, uh, independent shopping uh, would mean for visually impaired, we need to be able to help them navigate indoor spaces while all of you are used to uh, uh, GPS uh, control signals when driving a car or walking in outdoor spaces. Uh, navigation in indoor spaces is a lot more challenging. We'll look at uh, uh, that. Uh, how do you help them find the product uh, in a store among uh, thousands of different objects that look very similar? Uh, and uh, of course, one of the things that uh, I'll show you that we have developed as a priority right now is also to try and help find objects around the houses. All of us are uh, staying home more due to the uh, safety uh, reasons. So uh, the key challenges that we uh, uh, try to address are uh, to try and figure out how to make computers understand complex visual information. You, you may be reading a lot of articles which basically says uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning has made computers really uh, uh, powerful in detecting objects, face tracking, uh, uh, other technologies. However, uh, understanding uh, more complex visual information remains an open challenge. Things that we have developed include uh, how to help navigate a store, how to identify uh, products in the store, and uh, something unique that we have developed and tested 
over the last two uh, months is how to actually uh, help uh, pick the objects using uh, uh, smartphones that most of us uh, do have access to. Even if we can make computers understand complex visual information, one uh, big challenge remains in the viability of power, cost, and the speed at which things uh, would work. And I'm hoping uh, uh, my videos are streaming uh, uh, properly to you. Uh, there may be bandwidth restrictions, uh, things like that, uh, connectivity issues. Those are all uh, very real if you are really have to rely on existing systems which basically uh, let the visually impaired show their phone, transmit their image uh, remotely, and get a, a, a response back through Skype or uh, Facebook from uh, a distant relative or a friend, uh, those things become challenging. And from a power perspective, if you use a, a, a phone just to record video, not even to do all the computational uh, uh, complexities associated with understanding the vi visual information, you drain your phone in four hours. So if you start streaming that video or doing additional performance, it will drain even further. And in fact, we know from some smart glasses that they actually run out of power in about uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and even if we solve these type of problems, to try and translate the rich visual information that we are used to people who are visually impaired, remains a, a challenge. And I'm really thankful to many of the visually impaired uh, volunteers that we have had who have helped us refine the technology to make it accessible to more uh, at this time. One major inspiration for a processor that can do video analytics effectively is our brain. And independent of what you ate for your breakfast, your brain is operating at 20 watts of power. And typically the visual portion of it takes about 50% of this power. And it is pretty versatile and it's pretty robust. Even if you show an occluded face, you can recognize uh, if you are seeing someone after a long time, you probably recollect the context. So the power of doing such complex visual understanding in 10 watts is unparalleled in the world of computing yet. And consequently, we have actually uh, tried to develop brain-inspired software algorithms. And we have also started building brain-like hardware structures, uh, not to mimic the brain, but to try and implement uh, functions of video analytics a lot more efficient. And these have resulted in promising advances as we uh, have built many of these assistive systems. The team that's worked has actually looked at many different aspects. And just to try and uh, tie up pieces of uh, different aspects of this research, we have had neuroscientists trying to understand how the visual uh, uh, cortex works in a human brain. And based on some of these studies, we have actually built new computational models, for example, uh, the video that you're seeing on your left corner out here kind of shows what are you likely to see next, given that you saw something before when probably uh, trying to, let's say, you're ordering uh, a, a Subway sandwich uh, for lunch. So you probably look at the bun first, then the uh, sausage in between and others. So the likelihood of seeing an object increases based on what you saw earlier. And as far as uh, uh, computer systems architectures are concerned. We wanted uh, our assistive system to be immediately deployed on some of the uh, processors and technology that is available right now. And we are also building technology that has actually seen itself uh, start appearing in commercial products uh, um, as we have developed things over the last seven, eight years. And then there are still some uh, uh, fundamental science advances that we continue to make that may land up coming into a product uh, near you in probably the next uh, uh, five to 10 years. And um, the final aspect of it is uh, the user interface, uh, haptic sound uh, uh, interfaces with which we can uh, interact with the visually impaired people. 
let's start in, uh, getting a glimpse of uh, uh, the insights into how each one's uh, um, uh, each one of these elements contribute to the design of the system. Let's start with some of the brain inspired algorithms that we have designed. So if you look at the uh, video on the left corner, this makes use of a very simple technique that our brain uh, uses, which is the attention uh, mechanism. And this uh, one on the left side is what's called as uh, uh, bottom up attention. If you are looking for moving cars, the first thing that you look for is just things that move in an image. And instead of actually having to process the entire image, you can see the attention map seen in this inset helps you to locate only places in this large image that have cars. Consequently, you can throw out a lot of redundant information in high resolution images and still be analyzing smaller portions of the image efficiently. Now let's imagine a trip to a grocery store. And of course, you want to be really quick in the grocery store these days. So one of the things is, if you know that you are going to pick tomatoes, then we have what is called as bottom-up attention. You already know tomatoes are likely to be uh, uh, red in color. So your brain kind of gravitates to just this portion of the image really quick and filters out everything else. Trying to apply some of these brain-inspired information into our systems helps us to process things much more quickly and with very little, uh, a, a fraction of the power that's required for processing things by brute force. And here is another uh, technique that I uh, um, showed you. This is about trying to look at priors by trying to bias what you would see based on what you already saw previously. And this reduces the cognitive load from trying to recognize every object in the world to only most likely objects that you're about to see after you have seen something before. So this is another uh, technique that we land up employing in our algorithms. And let's consider another technique that we uh, deploy in our systems. I'll give you a few seconds to kind of guess what this is. And of course you saw a salt and of course the pepper goes along with it. So even if you didn't see the pepper and if our visually impaired person's camera has an occlusion, which is preventing us from seeing the real object, it may basically get some hints based on what it sees next to it and enhance the accuracy of our rec recognition systems. And this is something that we do to our, in our grocery stores, for example. So when we, uh, uh, what we have done is we have taken these pictures and looked at co-location of these objects. Oh, I see soap, now do I see some uh, uh, um, washing machine uh, 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 parts next to it? I, I see a type uh, uh, A of uh, a soda and I see a type two of a soda, they are both typically next to each other in the store that I land up going. So if I see this, I'm more likely to see something else next to it. And here is uh, uh, our system at work when you kind of uh, have a, a, a shopping cart uh, uh, moving around an aisle. It's basically trying to learn these type of relationships, particular to your own grocery store that you're going. So if you have gone there, couple of times with someone else, this database is actually developing as you go and see that. And most of you probably work this way intuitively, right? Uh, you go, you know where each product is. Once you see another object, you are able to pick things uh, much more quickly. And what this lands up doing for our visual system is if you are trying to identify what is behind this red box that you see, you could probably guess this by looking at everything that is spatially next to it. And this is what we call as a visual co-occurrence network or visual co-occurrence information. And if you were to guess, you're probably 
getting hungry for chips right now. And if you guess Doritos more specifically, yes, you were right in this particular scenario. And now you can see how it got easy that the brain does seamlessly. And these are type of things that we have included in our system implementation to make things faster and more far efficient. And here is another trick uh, that we actually uh, used, knowing that we now are assisting a visually impaired person who's wearing this assistive technology. And we really didn't throw everything at the algorithm to take care of all the scenarios, but really leverage the abilities that this person had in trying to refine our system. Here is one such example. Surf is a feature extractor that basically looks at an image and tries to look out for edges, shapes, and other aspects. And one interesting property of this feature detector is that it is rotation invariant. So if you rotate a particular object, it still will be able to match the feature, in this case, from honey bunch ores to the reference uh, feature of it, independent of the direction. In cases, and this may be something that you are also used to, when you are looking at a, a, a note or when you are looking at an object, when you look at it from one direction, you probably don't identify them. So maybe you are looking at some person in their side view and you guess, hey, this appears to be Vijay. But then when you look at me at my face in the frontal view, you're sure, oh, this is definitely Vijay. And what we'll end up using is using this SIRS rotational invariance property to now come back and not just make a detection when you see me at the side view, but ask the person to move around and look at the object in the front view, which increases the confidence of our matches and increases the accuracy with which our cameras are identifying objects in the eye. And consequently, we don't really need five cameras looking at five different directions, which would have made our system a lot more complex. Leveraging the simple notion that we have the human in the loop, ask them to move around until our confidence in the system improves was a real uh, useful function. And this small, subtle change made us get close to 100% accuracy in many of our trials. And of course, uh, one other aspect that uh, uh, is going to be the undercurrent in many of these things that I don't expand too much until the very end is we have also been building specialized hardware that lands up processing these type of image processing algorithms much faster than they exist in traditional processes that you may land up getting in your uh, cell phone or your laptops or desktops. Uh, uh, so here you see uh, our custom accelerator is about either one fourth or half uh, uh, the time uh, is required in trying to do this uh, computational aspects. And the final aspect of course is how would we interact with the visually impaired person? What would they, where would the camera be? And one uh, thought that we had is since in a grocery store, the primary goal is to actually pick the object. We landed up having the camera as close to the palm as possible. And we attached this to a, a glove, which also had tactile feedback. And you can see the uh, items labeled one, four, five. One is actually a communication fabric that was going to the computer to get commands uh, from the computer uh, based on what the camera was seeing. And there were motors, uh, mini motors placed at the fingers. So for example, uh, uh, stretch out your hand and if you imagine your pinky finger is uh, uh, moving, you would move uh, this way, if your thumb is moving, you would move left. If there was something vibrating on the top of your palm, you would move up. Uh, if something was vibrating below your palm, you would move down. So this was kind of a very simple tactile feedback that we incorporated the glove to do this. 
And of course, we uh, also try to overlay speech like up, down, forward uh, type commands in trying to help pick the object. And what resulted from this was our first uh, 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 prototype. The third eye project is making machines that can both see and perceive the world. Slide right, step forward. The system uses both auditory and haptic feedback on the glove to guide them to their intended product. The third eye project gives me confidence to do a task that blind people aren't normally able to do on their own. Once we started experimenting uh, with the system, we started uh, uh, looking, finding out some limitations. So when you basically have a hand and a, a camera right on top of it, and when you're trying to pick something, like I'm trying to come and grab my screen, the hand basically uh, prevents the camera from looking at the object. And uh, so what really happened in this particular system is we, in some of the cases, was kind of heart-wrenching uh, as you looked at some of these uh, experiments, the hand almost got to the object, but then at the last second, the palm basically occluded the camera and the camera lost sight of the object and basically made the system stop giving commands left, right, or stop vibrating. And the same thing happened is uh, when you try to come to an object, but miss the object to the side or the top, then again, the camera loses sight of the object and then you lose uh, track of the object. So what was required was some sort of a memory to indicate when I was in position X, the object was slightly in front of me and I moved my uh, hand a little further, where would the object be even if the camera loses sight? And that was the insight that we got that we needed to incorporate in our next version of the system so that the occlusion did not prevent. And of course, another thought was to try and figure out was our idea to place the camera and the palm the best option, right? So that, that, that was another uh, aspect. And uh, another challenge that we observed is when we were trying to give comments on left and right, all of them were with respect to the position of the hand. And in case the position of the hand was a little different from the position of the body, then the directions of left and right uh, were very different in this particular uh, uh, scenario. So we came up with our next enhanced prototype to try and address some of these issues. And again, the great thing about this whole project, it was a really team effort. We had students uh, from uh, middle school all the way to uh, uh, veteran uh, scientists participate in some of these ideas. And here you see a bunch of undergraduate students who really landed up uh, doing the uh, most of the work in building this prototype that you're seeing. They included uh, a head view camera to prevent hand occlusion. They started uh, tracking the hand uh, uh, relative uh, uh, to its position uh, to the object that they needed to bring. And they used a combination of both speech and haptic feedback uh, to the user. A grocery assistant system is the Microsoft HoloLens, an augmented reality headset which has many of the sensors we need for computer vision tasks. At the center of the assistant system is a wireless glove which provides haptic feedback in the form of vibration felt on the palm and fingertips. These vibrations provide an intuitive form of instruction to the user, indicating in which direction they should move their hand. We have attached blue lights to each motor, giving you a visual indication of which motor is vibrating. As the user faces the store shelves, images are streamed to a server in the cloud. In the cloud, a server processes the images from the assistant system, utilizing a mix of CPU, GPU, and custom hardware accelerators on FPGAs. Here, frames from the assistant system are being processed in real time on an FPGA accelerator running surf interest point detection. The results of the processing are then sent back to the assistant system, where they are used in conjunction with the HoloLens's hand tracking system to calculate the hand's position relative to the item on the shelf. Finally, position information is sent over Bluetooth to the glove, which issues feedback in the form of vibrations at different points on the glove. Here, you can see the results of the hand tracking from the point of view of the user, side by side with the view of which motors are vibrating on the glove. 
the grocery assistance system is able to quickly and accurately navigate a user to an item on the store shelf. So when we were developing uh, uh, all these technologies, uh, uh, somewhere uh, around two, uh, 2016 or so, uh, there was a ground shift in uh, some of the technologies and also in some of the user patterns that we started seeing. Uh, there was a lot more uh, 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 smartphones uh, uh, coming into the uh, market space. And there were a lot of assistive technologies that some of these smartphones had uh, beyond uh, uh, technologies that we were developing. For example, uh, there are accessibility features like voice over when you use your uh, touch phone, uh, uh, touch screen uh, phones. Uh, initially, uh, as a person, uh, not um, uh, aware of uh, the day-to-day -day challenges of uh, people with visual uh, impairment, I was not very uh, uh, clear that uh, a touch screen would be uh, user-friendly to uh, people with a visual impairment, but there are a lot of people uh, with visual impairment who use voiceover uh, uh, with these uh, phones pretty well, uh, and this is something that I have learned. And another aspect is while we worked on all these feature extractors like SURF and uh, uh, other brain-inspired algorithms that I saw, there was another aspect called deep neural networks that was starting to get better and better if you were able to feed it a lot of training data, a lot of training data, and we'll see how much. So for example, to train a very small network, you needed 1.2 million labeled training data. So that was uh, too much for us because uh, in our particular application, when we started our project, we never had uh, any uh, standard grocery store items database, let alone uh, uh, things label. And we tried labeling using some graduate students and undergraduate students who volunteered time. But it's a time consuming process and it's error prone someone could basically label the entire shelf and say, hey, there was uh, honey uh, Cheerios in that particular image, or someone would basically circle just the text honey Cheerios in a cereal box and say that is uh, uh, the uh, label for that particular object. So this really did not work as well for us to uh, generate the, uh, uh, utilize the power of these deep networks. And what was very fortunate is uh, when you have a uh, lot of uh, um, uh, undergraduate students and people uh, uh, just uh, um, uh, coming out of their teenage years, you basically see a lot of people with experience in gaming environments. And that came in very handy uh, uh, for us because uh, they were all familiar with virtual environments and gaming environments, and they could create virtual supermarkets for me. And this was really good because now you're actually placing objects in different places. You can rotate them. You can create data sets really, really quick uh, using these virtual environments. And this played a big role in enhancing some of the accuracy of our downstream uh, 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 systems that we actually built. And we also landed up uh, adapting our third eye prototypes to uh, uh, smartphones. And one thing that I would like to note out here is this particular uh, uh, system was something that was in progress and some of the testing we were supposed to uh, visit some of the groups uh, across Pennsylvania to do some face-to-face uh, -face testing. Uh, but uh, due to the resilience of our visually impaired uh, volunteer community, as well as graduate students, Nelson, Suyang, and Changen, and my colleagues, uh, uh, Jack Carroll and Mary Beth Rosen, we were able to continue uh, doing these tests even remotely. And here is- uh, Now we're going to present a demo of our application. Aki Charms. Scanning. Please, please slowly move the camera in front of you. I'll tell you when I find the item. Scanning. Item found. Click the guide button when you are ready. Guide. Button. Guide. Button. Start guidance. Lucky Charms is 31.1 inches away. 34 degrees to the right and 11.7 inches below from the camera view. Right. Right. Right.
left, 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 left. Lucky Charms is in front of the camera. Click the confirm button or shake the phone when you are ready. Guide. Dip. Confirm. Button. Please move the item in front of the camera. You got it. You have Lucky Charms. So, uh, uh, if you uh, notice that particular video, we were able to put uh, these detection systems into a phone and help and try to trial test this uh, inside homes of the graduate students. And then they were able to uh, ship some of these uh, smartphones to some of our volunteers uh, um, who were uh, uh, trying out this technology and the updates to the software that were uh, used to help pick objects in their homes. Uh, and this is a technology uh, that could uh, continue to help people uh, who are alone in their homes without any assistance. Uh, and uh, this uh, experiment was carried again by Zoom, where the graduate students interacted with the visually uh, impaired volunteers to try and evaluate the technology and help them adapt to new technologies uh, really quick. And again, uh, I, I'm thankful for the opportunity to work with such volunteers as well as uh, graduate students uh, who were uh, really uh, trying to push the envelope on this. Of course, one challenge is to try and uh, pick an object in front of you, but how do I navigate a complex environment such as uh, 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 indoor grocery shop? And one technique that we are deploying right now is to actually have uh, uh, a path tracing where uh, uh, a participant who's, uh, who can see records a path, loads that for the uh, person with visual impairment who can retrace the path. So imagine uh, going into uh, a new building and you are walking them uh, to the restroom. But then if they need to come back, you don't need to wait for them there. They could basically retrace the path. So here is uh, one such uh, um, uh, functionality that uh, highlights this type of a uh, indoor navigation assistant. The following clip shows how to record a path for people with visual impairment. Right now it is recording a path from cafeteria to bathroom and vice versa. Stop tracing. Button. Navigate. Repeat direction. Navigate. Button. Turn or retrace. This video shows how indoor navigation works on the record path. again looking at the visual features uh, leaving notes of what visual features and what sequence and helping you uh, uh, get there uh, on your own so uh, let me talk a little bit about the brain uh, inspired architectures and hardware that we are doing and one of the challenges is if we start doing a lot of these complex video analytics with uh, just the machines that we have and looking at the task complexity of uh, visual analytics go beyond just detecting individual objects. If you want to understand more complex scenes, if you want to understand interactions between people, if you want to identify actions that are necessary, then the complexity in traditional machines really grows really quick. Consequently, we have been uh, trying to build architectures that you are seeing on the left corner, which are very similar to the neurons and synapses. And what has really made this possible over the last uh, 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 five years is the emergence of technologies where you put these very small vertical uh, uh, cylinders. These are uh, non-volatile memory. Non-volatile memory essentially means storage devices that do not lose their state when you remove power. And you can place them in a very small uh, uh, footprint across two contact wires, and you can place them very densely. 
and the presence of this technology has helped to enable highly dense memories and they also have capability of incorporating some amount of computation while doing the uh, uh, memory and it has transformed the traditional notion of computing and memory being different in current day processes and consequently let me just illustrate three examples of things that we have done inspired by the brain we have been able to mimic the brain's working memory model by selectively storing certain things and erasing certain other things when storing in memory and of course one thing that i would like you to do is selectively store the highlights of my talk and forget about any mistakes that i had in the talk right and doing such a thing in an architecture like this gives you 150x performance so it's 150 times faster than cpu and gpu what does that mean you could basically analyze more complex things in a given time and we also sorry about that i don't know what happened with the sorry about that uh, uh, glitch uh, the next uh, part is uh, we use an encoding similar to the brain rather than actually work with a traditional type of numbers like integers or fractional numbers we think about on off pulses encoding and when we are able to use these type of pulse type of systems we find that we are 500 times more energy efficient than state of the art accelerators that means if you had a battery that battery would last 500 times more and another thing as i mentioned to you our architectures have transformed the notion that memory and compute are different in traditional computers now they are one and the same fused together and this has both energy and performance benefits these are some of the benefits that we have derived from brain inspired uh, 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 computations we have now and if you think about the brain brain is a 3d structure but typical chips have transistors and active devices only on one layer we are transforming this and we have ongoing work which is basically building 3d structures of chips that now are able to reduce the amount of time that it takes to traverse by clustering things together and this has resulted in technologies where we are seeing about 50 times faster uh, than what we can do with state of the art today. What you are seeing here is a bunch of retro nodes that basically started out of sync but landed up syncing together. We have now been able to replace these metronomes with tiny nano devices. Nano devices are thinner than your hair, right? And when you have two of these nano devices that are oscillating, so the going up and down oscillation is similar to your metronome oscillating. And when you put coupling capacitors like the substrate out here, they start doing functions that are very different. Traditionally, if cameras needed to detect color, you needed to do complex math that you don't want to imagine right now. You want to do square root, you want to do square, you want to do division. But now in our new system, all it does, it takes the pixel values into a bunch of these oscillators and based on what state the oscillator lands up being in and then you detect it, you are able to go back and say, this is brown color in the horse. And the beauty of it is since you simplified how the color is detected, it takes far less power for the same time than your traditional computational methods. So we still have a lot of ongoing effort, uh, uh, efforts. We are trying to support more advanced analytics, uh, maybe even query prior uh, data store. And these are things that would be useful for uh, also cited individuals, uh, especially for people with uh, memory loss. Uh, we are looking at other user interfaces, which is not just telling you, hey, these are the objects that I want to buy from a grocery store. Can it actually help me scan the visual world 
and alert me to the presence of some objects. We are working on hardware technologies that will now bring these things to a mobile platform, your handheld devices and can last without battery recharges for a long time. And one thing that we are really, really interested in is to make sure this really reaches a wider uh, uh, community for usage scenarios. I'll leave you with some uh, uh, quick thoughts on uh, uh, what uh, the students have been working on and how they've, uh, you could repurpose some of the technologies that we have been doing uh, for other things uh, uh, that are essential in the stay at home days. I'll show you some examples of those. Of course, one of these things is our remote uh, interaction. My camera is in front of you. If I had your feed, I could see whether you're happy, you're surprised. Uh, uh, hopefully, you're all very happy uh, looking at this video, right? So uh, this can also be used for remote uh, education to make sure the students are still engaged when we do these type of uh, remote lectures. Uh, of course, one of the things that at least stopped in Center County uh, was we stopped recycling uh, for a few weeks. So this inspired another student to do this uh, uh, particular- The letter has become so ubiquitous in the US that over $9 billion are spent each year to clean it up. Trash is harmful to our environment, our infrastructure, and our health. So how can we combat this? By using UAVs and machine learning to pull trash disposal. First, we collected and labeled over 2,200 images of trash featuring different locations, lighting, occlusion, etc. From here, we created a quantized tennis flow model using transfer learning with a movement model. Our model was designed specifically to run on the Coral Edge TPU accelerator. The TPU attaches to the Intel Ready to Fly drone to perform onboard object detection inference to identify and pick up trash. The quantized model works pretty well with a 50% mean average precision overall. A custom 3D printed claw mechanism is used to pick up the trash. Our future plans involve creating our drones in house for a more robust system. Another project that you are probably going to hear a lot more about is a collaboration with uh, Professor Christina Grassinger. Uh, the students have been rigging up these cameras to try and detect uh, pollinators. So what you see in this test rig is a camera looking up uh, at uh, um, one of the uh, insects uh, that Cody had in at her home. And these are all things that were ordered and assembled uh, during this uh, particular uh, uh, stay at home uh, uh, period. This really shows how resilient our student community is in continuing with these uh, innovations. Uh, this project has uh, provided uh, me the fortune to work with a lot of people, uh, a lot of different outreach activities to uh, be able to involve. And we are uh, looking forward to uh, more of this. I'll leave you with uh, one final uh, video uh, uh, to showcase uh, and leave you uh, to ask any questions. You can all see these steps. If there are more electrons in the capacitor, it's a one. If it's three in the world, the electrons, it's a zero, right? <laughs>
Thank you very much. Any questions? Well, thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Narayanan. Uh, we do have a couple questions coming in. Uh, first question is, um, in what ways are grocery, grocery stores store. adapting to your technology and, and how is that partnership developing? So uh, right now, uh, one of the things when I talked about the complexity reduction of our system, rather than throw everything at the computing system to try and decipher what's there. Uh, some of our uh, uh, initial collaborators are willing to share the planogram of the grocery store. So it basically primes me to what is there. So instead of looking at a typical uh, a grocery store with about 45,000 objects, when they give me the planogram, I know where I am it really reduces the task of a computer from trying to find the object among 45,000 to probably just another uh, 100 within that particular shelf. And that substantially reduces the complexity and the accuracy of our vision algorithms. And uh, right now our partnerships are more one-to-one uh, -one in local uh, state college and uh, places around University Park. If there are other alumni who are willing to uh, uh, participate in this effort and help us make the connections, I would be very thankful. Right. So, um, so we know uh, by going to the grocery store, there's such a diversity in not only products, but in um, sizes that those actual products come in. Um, has your technology developed to the point where you could tell the difference between eight and 16 ounces um, size and how do they know that they have exactly what they're looking for? So at this uh, point, uh, uh, I, I will not pretend that my uh, prototype actually does the eight and 16 ounces, but right. one of the things uh, uh, from our user studies is uh, uh, typically the eight ounce and 16 ounce is going to weigh differently and sure. the shape is different. That is not a part that I've uh, seen are visually impaired uh, volunteers ask for help. In fact, uh, one of the trial tests that we did just uh, over the last uh, two months, we actually had a very similar scenario where boxes were of two different sizes and they were easily able to say which object was what without my system actually helping them. Having said that, we are also uh, in the confirmation process that you saw briefly uh, in one of the videos. We also have text recognition capability that we are trying to embed. That's again developed by my colleagues, Lee Giles and Dan Kiefer. And we have one of the state-of-the-art text recognition systems. So we could easily deploy that right now, but our prototype doesn't support it as is currently, but we have means to support it if we find a need. Great. So um, we have time for one more question. Uh, the question is, um, talk a little bit about um, the, the level of accuracy that you will need to, um, that your prototype will have to perform at to take it to the next level where it would become readily available to the visually impaired. I, I would imagine that there's some, um, that there's some legal concerns that you're thinking about, like what's the liability if this product is used and it selects the wrong product and it's dangerous to the end user. So talk about kind of what, what accuracy milestones you need to hit to take this to market? So in fact, I believe as far as taking it to market, we have actually, as I showed the prototypes that we have developed and tested, it's actually over the span of about uh, seven years. Uh, we know many of the ins and outs and uh, the most recent user study that we have done uh, uh, promises that it's probably going to be soon where uh, the app is going to be available in an Android or an Apple phone uh, next to you. And as far as uh, the legal uh, 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 ramifications for it, uh, I would probably let my lawyer speak for me. <laughs> not really get into it. So, uh, uh, but, but having said that, uh, uh, one of the key aspects in moving the technology, again, I've been very fortunate to work with students who are very interested in moving this technology to the commercial space. 
some of these elements have been transitioned to real products either by some of my former students through their own companies. And there are a bunch of students currently uh, uh, participating in one of the commercial challenges in getting these phones out to the people. And I'm hoping, and I know some of my students are listening too, that this technology will actually get to their hands by the end of summer. So wow. uh, we, we are really hopeful about that part. And again, if there are uh, people in the audience with uh, better knowledge about uh, the legal ramifications and other aspects of it, uh, we would definitely appreciate uh, any insight that you have. But I think the accuracy and uh, other technological aspects are probably pretty good. None of these videos were just mock videos that I actually show. They are not concept videos. They really work uh, currently. They have been uh, trial tested enough. So I'm not worried about the accuracy, but now you got me talk, uh, thinking about <laughs> uh, the legal consequences, but uh, that, that's one step at a time. Absolutely. Well, fascinating research that you're doing. It's really going to have an impact and help people that, that need it the most. Thank you for joining us today. That's all the time that we have. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Narayan, and for joining us. And I'd also like to thank all of you who have tuned in to the virtual speaker session, whether it's through Zoom or on Facebook Live. As a reminder, we'll be having additional speaker sessions in the coming weeks. And this programming is in addition to the wide array of online networking events and career programs that are available throughout the year. You can find the full listing of all the events through the Alumni Association at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Thanks again, and we are Penn State. Thank you very much again. Have Thank a you. wonderful evening. That was great.